Hey guys, this is Joe. Today I want to introduce you to our partner Vanta. Achieving ISO 27001 or SOC 2 compliance can unlock major growth for your company and build customer trust, but the process can be time intense and costly. Vanta automates compliance, getting your audit ready quickly and saving up to 85% of associated costs. And Vanta scales with your business, helping you enter new markets. Join 7,000 global companies like Atlassian, Flow Health, and Quora that trust Vanta. Claim 20% off Vanta at vanta.com forward slash startup radio that's vanta.com spelled v-a-n-t-a dot com forward slash startup radio welcome to startuprad.io your podcast and youtube blog covering the german startup scene with news interviews and live events Hello and welcome everybody. This is Joe from StartupRate.io, your startup podcast from Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, as well as founder and host of the world's number one tech entrepreneurship radio called Startup.Radio. Wherever you're watching this, wherever you're listening to this, go to StartupRate.io and you can learn more. Today, I would like to welcome somebody from the GSA area, originally from Austria. Christian, hey, how you doing? Hi, Joe. Pleasure to be here. I'm doing fine. That is great. And you are already smiling. That is a pretty good start. Um, but you are actually here, even though you are from Austria, where most people from outside Germany, or uh, Germany, Austria or Switzerland wouldn't be able to tell the difference. There are always slight differences be like between, um, what would be a good example between French, uh, France and Belgium, between Canada and the US, you know, the, the those little differences between bordering countries who share languages. But today, our enablers, this is another interview in cooperation with Hessen Trade and Invest and the Enterprise Europe Network. This recording was made possible by HTAI and the Enterprise Europe Network Hessen. These organizations have made tremendous contributions to helping startup businesses succeed and thrive providing a range of services from helping to find grants to ongoing partnerships. By taking advantage of these resources, startup companies can network and develop innovative strategies for success on the international stage. The dedicated support of ATAI and the Enterprise Europe Network Hessen is paramount in providing startup businesses with the tools for lasting success. Look for our dedicated sub podcast in partnership with them. It's called Tech Startups Germany, or you can find the link on our link tree as well as our matching website, startupraven.com. If you hurry, you will be, you could be the 11th thousand person to sign up. But now, Christian, getting to you, and there's a lot, lot ahead of us. Um, as we said, we, you started your journey working and co-founding startups. Uh, I would say mo not not every time, but most of the time you have been a CTO, right? Quite often, right? <laughs> Quite often. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, you've seen so many startups, so many technology companies from the inside. What is the most annoying part for a CTO there? <laughs> What is the most annoying part? That's a novel question, I must admit. Um, the most annoying. So I, the, I don't know, the, the most annoying thing, I think, from a CTO perspective, and it's a question, what is a CEO? CTO, CTO is, you know, somebody who has a technical background. Um, but I think the key part about a CTO is also that he understands business. Um, he understands how to leverage technology for business. Um, and the most annoying thing is, um, if you actually have the sense of business and have not the possibility to align business and to the, the um, developers fully, which means I think it's really important that every developer understands the context of the customer, talks to the customer, engages with him, and it's clear why we do the things we do. Um, and if this is not possible, because, for example, in my past, there is a head of product, uh, for example, leading the product managers, head of design, leading the designers, and then you have developers in the are treated as, um, uh, like, I, I, I love the term, coding monkeys, um, I think then you have a problem. 
Yeah, um, and it's, 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 as soon as this is established in the culture, I think it's really one of the biggest problems, actually. And I think it's very important that this is not the case. I think that an engineer is, is an artist and it's like, it's like this kind of bricklayer story, you know. You, the one thing is you're a bricklayer. The other thing is actually you're building a church, you know. Um, and I think this is so important um, that you as an engineer are really clear what every brick, what everything you do actually means for the bigger picture. And you make those decisions and you can match those decisions because the engineer takes a lot of decisions actually every day that you can match those decisions on why we do the things we do. And yeah, always have this bigger picture in mind. So the, the most annoying thing is if, the, if that's, if that's broken, um, this kind of orientation towards actually um, the business and the value you actually want to create. Mm -hmm. I once talked to a very smart CTO and uh, he told me that many people with a business background don't understand if they draw something up on the whiteboard and say it has to be completely different than what we're doing right now, how much work actually the people in coding, in development do have at the end. And I do believe a lot of the job of the CTO is not only to um, really get the business working, meaning the tools who actually do the work in the back, uh, but rather um, to also manage expectations for the business side. Would you agree to that? No, absolutely. I think manage expectations to the business side is a key part. I, I would just go even further uh, because there's so much effort and eventually cost and time um, involved in certain things. It's like when you're pregnant, you cannot speed them up. You know, um, mm -hmm. it's so important to give exactly that context. What are the, um, what are the impacts of a decision? Um, but it will also again help to making the right decisions. Yeah. Because, um, it's very hard if the, 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 I, I hate big decisions when they're very risky. And I think it's so important actually to break them down and lay out how this works. I mean, that's, that has to be a tremendous done work done in the sense of, making things more incremental, making things iterative. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. yes, you can have as a, I don't know, as a founder, CEO, you can have this kind of big vision. I want to create this platform, but where mm -hmm. do you start? What is the first step? What does this actually mean? And there's a lot of questions around this, which I, especially CTO now coming to that case, it, it, that's his job, I think, from that perspective, really making that kind of, yeah, um, strategy plans, making this iteratively so that you don't have, like we have like build construction, like the, in Berlin here, the airport is a big example of a construction, which, you know, is cost exploding, but in software, there are many projects, which also had, had way more costs than you actually anticipated. Yeah. So this is the reason why this is so important, I think, to make this really in a meaningful way. And with software, it's a good thing is you can make things very iteratively typically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not, not like the, 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 the huge leaps, you prepare something for years and make something completely different, but I'm also a believer in the very small steps. I actually had this also when I was interviewing Lukasz Kodowski and asked him for the secrets of his success. And he said, always the incremental improvements. As we've already established, you have been, you are from Austria. Your very first station was a betting portal, sports betting portal called BWIN, well known across Europe. Um, how, how did you get this? Oh, but, 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 but. Before we get to that, another touristic information. We already have established how beautiful Vienna can be before Christmas. <laughs> Would you have another recommendation for people considering a trip to Austria? Oh, I, I'm from Vienna, so I definitely recommend Vienna. It's beautiful. The Christmas markets around Christmas time are amazing. My grandmother is from Salzburg. Um, which is in the middle of, it's also in Austria. It's in the middle of the mountains. Um, and it's beautiful. Um, it's a very beautiful, um, place, especially in winter because also you have snow and can ski there. And then I'm from Austria. So I really love the mountains. Yeah. I see. I see. So, and now we have this other way. How did you get into B win? Was it a bet? <laughs> um, it's a little bit longer story, but uh, how did I get into it? Um, so the first thing out of university, I'm, I'm actually a university dropout because I founded my own company. Um, studying was very boring for me. <laughs> longer story to that. And out of that first company I founded myself, I eventually sold that and joined another company which uh, required tech developers to build it for the IPO, um, which was an ad network, a little bit like Google DoubleClick network. Um, 
back then, and um, that work didn't work out. They failed in the IPO, and that's the reason um, when Devin asked us, asked us, and I was seeing my co back then co-founder me to join, um, because it's a Devin is one of the so this is a global leader in online gaming yeah, and gambling, uh, which means sports betting, but also poker and other other products. Yeah? And back then, when I joined, about thirty people, and actually, literally, I was the first engineer. It's an interesting story because I think they did an IPO without actually having anything built themselves internally, um, and they said they want to become the leader in online gaming um, gambling. So from that perspective, um, they said, "Okay, hey, Kristen, can you help us to build that?" Actually, um, and it was. Back then, again, this was 2001, yeah? Um, back then, I think from a tech perspective, it was a really interesting problem. It's like a little bit like, and I don't like to, uh, looking back, I wouldn't do that anymore, but back then it was just really interesting. Pornography and betting um, have been quite advanced when it comes to um, uh, to technology and they faced a lot of challenges because also there was a business opportunity quite early on. And for me, talking about the technology side, I had the opportunity to help that. And it's like really interesting because you have these world championships, yeah, and then you have this kind of life games and how to make that actually happening, how to build this, and then you have to try to deal with cybersecurity when people uh, try to extort you actually to get money and, and threaten you to shut it down. It's a lot of complexity, and building that was quite exciting, and it was a long journey. I was, as mentioned, joining as number thirty roughly, and I was leaving when I was three thousand people. Um, so I went through this nine years for really like this kind of growth period from early, um, from the early days, literally to building it um, to the world's online leader in that business. Yeah. Just another question out of pure, uh, out of pure curiosity, slow Joe here. Um, would you still have an idea how you could game online betting websites? <laughs> Uh, so it's an interesting business in, in a nutshell that bookkeepers, you know, the bookies who make the odds, um, they are, they're professionals at, in their sports and they have, they have all the data on their side. Yeah. Uh, but then again, uh, the reality is if you and there are many people who are really good as well in sports, like in tennis, and it depends sometimes on one person. Um, then you have a really good luck, a good chance actually to to be better than the bookkeeper because at the end it's just odds which they put in favor. In a nutshell, that's the reason you can win at one game eventually. But I think it's really tough. Like it's like with all those systems, there's a likelihood which is in favor of the house. Um, so in the long run, it's just designed in a way um, that it's fun, but you also lose money in a nutshell. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So that's the reason why I'm not a fan in general of online sports betting, except if it's for the thrill and for the fun, then it's fine. But I think there are too many negative effects looking now back. Why I, I wouldn't recommend it in general, yeah, from my perspective. Mm -hmm. If you play to earn money, it's just wrong. Um, that's the, the mm -hmm. problem about gambling, yeah, I think. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And then at one point you decide to leave, but we, you went for a little bit larger group. All the people listening to us on a regular basis, they would know Scout24 group. They have been maybe the first successful people building up platforms here. Uh, for example, used cars and real estate comes to mind because that they, they have been the Best known platforms there, Auto Scout 24, meaning, um, Car Scout 24 and Immobilien Scout 24, uh, Real Estate Scout 24 was something that stuck into my mind. Yes. And I had to put out, so I was, I was joining an Austrian entity, um, which is called Immobilien.net actually. And it was just later acquired by, by Scout24 and then opportunity to become their CTO, um, which for me was really interesting because it was the first time I could really step into this kind of technology leadership role. Um, and as it turned out, I mentioned before this kind of, um, when I thought it's one of the challenges for CTOs, I also had the opportunity there to take uh, be responsible for a product, um, and then together not just um, shape the technology strategy but also shape the product strategy. And for me, this was one of the really interesting learning curve. But also seeing the benefits actually of of these two sides coming together um, and being like in line and having a really clear 
uh, path for success. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, but the um, it, in Austria it was the leader, uh, the largest platform. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like if all of these platforms, um, if it's very hard if you have the the biggest offer because it's a demand. You have the supplier side and demand side. Um, yeah, and from that perspective, it was really interesting because pretty much every um, real estate um, in Austria I was responsible for was on our platform um, back then. Mm-hmm. Talking about the supply and demand side here, then you went for a dating website, which I found pretty interesting. And it gave me the question, did it change how you look for a partner? <laughs> So yesterday I joined Parship. Um, Peter Schmidt actually did uh, ask me to join. And he was convincing me actually with that also to move to Hamburg, which I enjoyed. Uh, looking back, was quite a lot. Um, yeah, and uh, the, I also there had the opportunity also to be responsible actually for science department. And um, at Parship, we would say it's not it's not dating, it's matchmaking. Um, we have been really in the uh, in this topic for making people long-term relations actually successful. And I learned actually a lot of it. The founder or the, one of the founders, uh, Dr. Schmale, um, he was actually a path therapist for centuries. And he did travel around all of our Germany for um, for a very long time and doing research about what makes actually successful relations. He himself, I think, was three times married, <laughs> multiple kids. <laughs> yeah, so he made also some hands-on experience himself, and he was the inventor of the algorithm behind that. Actually, and it's a really interesting one because um, I think it's not just true for relationships, private ones, but also for business relationships. Um, it's built on the the principle that actually, if to make a long-term relation successful. There needs to be certain things in common um, so that you really get along with each other, but there needs to be a certain differences um, so that you have enough thing to keep it interesting on the long term. Yeah, um, and figuring this kind of matching algorithm out and what this is and how can you ask real good questions to so that it's not obvious but indirect actually um, was one of the secrets at the beginning of actually um, the algorithm behind it. And it was an amazing job that you really get letters uh, from people who actually built their relationship based on that principle and then did get kids. And this was, uh, it was from that perspective, really an exciting um, journey. And now I think today, Parship is also a global leader, even in matchmaking, um, but, but now they also do actually dating. <laughs> so they extended their portfolio <laughs> from that perspective, yeah. Uh, I see. Um, two, two, two more, maybe three more positions I would like to pick out because what I found interesting, you have been for a few months chief product officer with the World Food Program, Share the Meal, very interesting position. Plus what also stands out, what many people label you, you've been for uh, a little bit over a year, almost two years, the CTO of N26 Group, um, the online bank the challenger bank uh we talked about so frequently in the news in the past what i found personally quite interesting is in one interview you said you helped them build a scalable platform um where was the difference between betting matchmaking mm-hmm. in terms of real estate matchmaking in terms of couples to getting an online bank i mean th- there's quite a difference in here at least from my personal perspective yeah, maybe talking about N26 um, yeah. here first. Um, the, I know um, Valentin and Maximilian, the founders of N26, since they have been in the accelerator, Axel Spring Plug and Play Accelerator, um, there was, I was mentor uh, for them. Yeah? So that's how we actually know each other since they, they founded um, N26, its inception. And only 2015, um, actually, I joined them because they have done the Series A. Um, and they said, hey, we actually started off with a very different product, which was Papaya, which was a, a, a teenager um, credit card, actually. And mm-hmm. then they switched to become a full bank. Um, and they had this, this um, they said, hey, um, we are, they actually didn't have a, a real working product to make this scalable and working. Uh, but that's just the first uh, rough iteration. Um and they asked me to help to build that product and the tech team uh, from that perspective. And I was joining um, from that perspective and as a CTO uh, to help them on the one hand side, build this whole um, core banking system, uh, build integrations with partners like 
wise, for example, but also for investment, for example, um, and then um, get a banking license in that combination. So build really a fully accredited, uh, a fully uh, core banking system, which is, can be supported and licensed. And we have been the, we have built the first um, core banking system in the cloud. I think nobody else before that was actually running on AWS in that kind of case. Um, we used it earlier as a, as, a, as a technology provider there. Um, and that was a very interesting and very exciting journey from that perspective as well. Uh, working alongside um, Max and Valentin and helping them really to shape, um, yeah, shape the next generation bank and how this can actually look like from that perspective. And the, the great thing about it is it was always very focused on, on, on users who have wanted to bank with their mobile devices and want to have full control and transparency on their finances. And that's what, what we did also when it comes to the product, how we de designed everything to make it really built for the people who want to have constant transparency and yeah, a control of their finances. And it's the reason why everything which Engine 6 has is, is designed actually for instant changes, for example, and, full, and, and, yeah, and also information, for example, when it comes to push notification. Today, it's all very normal and standardized, uh, but back then it was really novel um, in many regards. Um, what I've learned, maybe the, just to, to ask this question about Divin and what has this to do eventually with Engine 6, so they obviously had, had no had, had never worked in finance actually before. Um, I never had worked in a bank before. Yeah. Um, and then being, I, I, I thought it's very brave <laughs> of Marx and Valentin to ask me actually to join and build a bank with them. Um, so it was for myself actually a learning journey and also a tough one, to be honest. But on the other hand side, in the favor of me, I had some experience with BWIN building actually in a nutshell, a gambling system, which you have accounts, you have fraud, you know, um, it's actually from a technology perspective, very similar. Yeah, there mm -hmm. is the transactional consistency, um, high amount of volume, scalability, um, security, all these things matter in both uh, very much. Yeah? And then, um, and again, it's, it's also the topic just of fraud. I think uh, at N26, uh, at BWIN, we, we had, I don't know, we had, um, I think the coconut islands, for example, they exist there yeah, and they have, I don't know, like 5,000 people, inhabitants. And I think we had registered like a, a within 5,000 people from those islands. Yeah. And obviously that cannot be true. Yeah. But back then it was like always a question. How can we figure it out? And as the same is true for N26. So that's where I say there's a lot of benefits actually from again, our technology and product perspective and analogies what you can learn from one uh, and the other one. Um, yeah. D d d don't worry. That's totally fine. Very interesting insights. And, um, I only would mention one more position. You are a member of the Founder Institute in Berlin, which by the way is also present here in Frankfurt and they doing a good, a lot of good work. Big shout out to those guys. And now let, let's do the, 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 the complete circle from betting to matching real estate and cars, to matching couples, to doing finances, to have a nonprofit online university you co-founded. How did this happen? <laughs> yeah, um, looking forward, nothing makes sense. Now looking backward, um, it all comes together somehow because um, over the time, so one of the things I'm actually um, in love with since I dropped out of university is to use technology to have an impact. Um, now, what is impact has changed over time to be, uh, to be fair on that side. Yeah. But I was always fascinated this, by this kind of solving problems and really having an impact on people's life. Yeah. And the shifted now, um, the, the later we get, because also I have kids, I have three kids now. Um, so it shifted more to sustainability to have the, on the societal uh, way to have a positive impact. Um, but it was always my, my, my interest yeah, on, that, on that perspective. And this is some, something which is the, the red line throughout my whole life uh, from that perspective. Yeah? And um, just maybe coming to this, um, yeah, I um, mentioned partially it was very great. It was a really, I was I'm thankful for having that opportunity. I was also with N26, it was really great to have been part of that story and that journey and actually have the opportunity to, to do this. Now, looking back, really tremendous. Um, and even, even game changing, uh, things from that perspective. And tomorrow, um, now uh, just to mention now what tomorrow is here. Yeah, tomorrow is a next generation university, which we are developing, um, currently. 
and um, or have already built uh, and, and serving learners where we want to help to educate and empower the change makers of tomorrow so that we want we believe actually that this kind of sustainable society is uh, created by empowered and educated individuals and that's the reason why we are building this kind of next generation university and that's a very important thing now because um yeah, um, I mentioned that I dropped out of university, uh, but the, the reality is that my kids have been homeschooling here in the pandemic, and um, I noticed that nothing has changed um, in learning um, since I was in school. And the world has, you know, these kind of libraries, um, which have been really limited accessibility hundreds of years ago. Now you, you open your smartphone um, and you have any information at your fingertips or uh, with AI tools now, um, it just is a different environment. And um, I think that many of the um, education systems today are not designed for that. And they're not designed for actually helping you to learn. They're designed for helping you to know and remember things at a certain point of time. Uh, and I had always a feeling in school that I just need to learn something um, for the test, but there was no purpose. Uh, and the reality is in, my, in all those journeys from BVIN to N26, I had to learn a lot. Um, and it, it was really challenging to do this by myself because by my, if you're by yourself and try to understand the things which maybe you could have learned at the university, um, you, you, it's a lot of effort um, and it's a lot of, you need to build up a network of experts. For example, at N26, I didn't have a clue about core bike systems or so reach, reaching out, finding people who can help me to understand things better, yeah? um, asking them a lot of questions, understanding how finance system look work, how the swift money transfer works there's a lot of reading and de de diving very deep into it um and i think that uh, the right education really can accelerate you um so that's the reason why we founded the n20 uh, tomorrow university um to help really those kind of change makers um so that we can empower and educate them i understand i actually have to tell you I um I'm pretty surprised because you quoted um uh Kierkegaard the uh Danish philosopher who said life is only understood backward but lived forwards uh something I also totally um totally do agree uh, a quote uh, another uh, a great teacher taught me big shout out to Miguel Carrillo here and um it, it, that is fascinating because I hear this quite so often so you are an online university you're officially headquartered here in lovely frankfurt but as we as we know um it doesn't make a lot of difference in terms of online university because your reach can be global um do you have like streaming classes where people can actually live participate and do you um, accommodate different time zones talking about if people in Asia could consider joining your university. People, uh, use Pacific Coast. It, it's always a little bit, uh, tiresome to, to get something agreed between those, those, those two extremes because it's like a big world and we only have 24 hours in each day. <laughs> How do you do your education there? Like in terms of, of really attending classes? And how did do you substitute what so many great universities still do, meaning building the network, thinking about the MBA programs, for example, they're the, they're the classical networking stuff um, when you are on site? How do you do that? So that's a, a big question because it has a lot to do with, um, yeah, also what I learned myself, how actually learning works. And in a nutshell, it comes from, um, and that's why I don't like the term online university so much. For us, it's really about mm -hmm. how can we help you to learn effectively. And um, what and the, the reality is there's a lot of learning science and about this. And we know since 30 years how to do it, actually. It's just hard to change systems. Um, and this is also the reason why we found that Tomorrow University is a new player, because I think it's very easy. Sometimes it's easier to build something from the scratch and design it just that way. Um, and when it comes to, to our pedal, uh, to our learning model um our students learn based on real world challenges um so uh, we like to say that also we we love to bring you a little bit out of your comfort zone um and based on these real world challenges you build up that knowledge which you apply on the challenge 
And then when you apply it on the challenge, um, you actually sub create real working products and that you give, you submit, but also you get, give feedback to other students, um, on what matters actually. And in that regard, you have a, uh, a self reflection on what is, you distill what really matters and which is called mastery learning from that perspective. Um, and this is one part, um, how we do this. And the other part, um, is that, uh, and we like this kind of success formula from our perspective. It's we help you to define your purpose. Uh, we help you to learn, be become competent and learn the 21st century skills. And we also help you to build a network. And that combined, um, it has the, the, uh, the goal to, have helped you to have an impactful career. And our learners come from around the world. Um, you mentioned that already. Um, currently the, the learning, the, the time zone, um, when the classes are happening in the evening. So it's very easy actually in Asia to join our classes than in the US. Yet we have from both, uh, from both sides actually learners who are coming to us and a very different, um, yeah, very different, um, uh, backgrounds from that perspective. The, if you may imagine learning, um, it's very hard to concentrate and have a have a lecture and, and, and concentrate in a lecture. And I'm talking here about a physical hall. If you imagine, and I was at the university and I was sitting in classes, like lectures, there are 500 people just listening. It's pretty best, the best time to sleep. Yeah. And I think this is online just worse. If you have a, a lecture where somebody is talking, it's really hard if it's 90 minutes um, that you actually keep attention. So that's the reason why we also minimize anything we don't have traditional lectures actually we, we minimize any sessions which are live to high interactive sessions um everything uh, from self-study time you can do in your own time there are group works mm -hmm. where you come together but again then you as a group come together and you can schedule that yeah um so from our learning perspective you'll have a lot of um flexibility if there are videos and we also have short videos, which are sometimes really good to explain some certain things better, yeah, then we integrate them, but they are always very short and that's very to the point and part of the self study time typically. Yeah? Um, so the, the, from an online university program, it's just from a model different. We're focusing on interaction, um, to keep you really engaged. And this is also one of the, I think, exciting ways how you learn best. Um, is that you apply things because we don't have this kind of um, knowledge tests. Yeah, um, If you study with us, you submit your work and you get feedback on a quantitative and qualitative scale on your, on the word, on the, on the challenges you actually submit on your challenge mm -hmm. submissions. Yeah. Um, from that perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe to mention okay. one more sentence, uh, just to say this, what, what do you learn? Actually, we have different programs. You mentioned already our impact MBA program, which is about um, sustainability, leadership and innovation. The idea is really to help you transform yourself, transform your team and your organization. Um, so this is one part. Then we have a master of science, entrepreneurship and technology. This is especially if you are thinking about eventually starting a company, if you're thinking about being able to change your career to something sustainable. Um, and then we have bachelor programs in, for example, responsible entrepreneurship or a bachelor in AI and sustainable technologies. I see. So it, it, it's really broad. Of course, we'll all, as always, link down here in the show notes the whole university. And I do assume over time you may expand your program a little bit. Um, also, what is interesting for me, we already said it's a nonprofit organization, but you still raised venture capital. Are we talking about impact capital here? And what is the special challenge for a nonprofit at tech startup, which guys you are. So that's an interesting one. Um, the, our organization is a combination of both. Yeah? That, that's what you mentioned. We have on the one hand side venture capital and on the other hand side, we are a nonprofit. Why is this mm -hmm. so important? Um, we are mission driven. Yeah. So our purpose is to excellent transition to sustainable society. That's what we care about. And we care a lot about actually how we can actually empower uh, the people to have an impact uh, for career for that reason. Yeah? And that's also how we measure our success. Yeah. To ensure that um, we have a high quality educational mission and they can fulfill that. That's the reason why we have our nonprofit. Um, on the other hand side, we really want to have impact. Um, an impact. Um, we have this theory of change. Um, if you look at the planet, we have 8 billion people. 
um, and you need to reach a certain number of people to have a certain number of change. And we have a calculation for that. And <laughs> we want to reach actually 1 billion people by 2030. Now you can ask me 2030 if we achieve that. I'm really curious myself. Um, but I fully believe that this is realistic and possible. Um, and with that also that we are creating is actually a community for this kind of um, change um, towards mm -hmm. sustainability. And um, for that, you need capital um, and you need to have the freedom uh, to act. Yeah, and that's the reason this is the venture case uh, where we also have um, a technology team where we build a, a software platform for effective learning. Um, and this is where we raised also money and where we need to raise money to actually build that kind of um, scale. Mm -hmm. I see. So, um, what, what would you think about the universities that are still around like the physical universities do they need a little bit do they need to move a little bit more into the direction of online degrees and would you guys also need to have for example on a regular basis in bars in paris in london uh, wherever your students are uh, some hangouts that the people at least who are in the same city studying or in the same general area studying would you think uh, that is a way that those two models somehow merge a little bit so you can have the uh, best of both worlds so the um the interesting thing is learning online really works in fact more effective pretty much and we can the what we also can do is with technology we can personalize the learning way better to you than what you as a teacher if you have a class of 50 people it's very hard to adopt um the learning to the individual um it's very hard to fit his needs and um so we, we do really an amazing job then we see this With my kids every day in, in school, how, how hard is this for teachers? And I think this is where technology can help. And this is also where online learning eventually is more effective. And the same is true for meeting the right people. Um, it, we can connect you actually you know, really effectively online. Um, we can match you <laughs> from that perspective with people around the world um, to come together, to collaborate, um, to have to, you know, to, to learn from each other, um, to connect. Yeah. Um, but yet we are social beings. Yeah. And I think this kind of social personal connection to deepen actually relationships is really, really important. And it's not just, in, it's, it's important for, for, our, for everybody of us. Yeah. So that's the reason why what we do is we have, um, Yeah, online we have a, met a campus in the metaverse, which is also already social. So you see who is interacting. You can ap approach people. Um, you have this kind of um, classes where it's not so transactional. You see the academic before. You can walk him up, um, ask him questions, and it's a it's a really it's actually a very good experience already. But nonetheless, we do be combining it with meetups uh, around the world. So last week, for example, we had a meetup in Hamburg. We had one in Vienna, we had one in Berlin, we'll do one in Paris and London, um, where the students come together, actually, um, and there they connect and celebrate, party, um, etc. And we have local learning groups. Uh, for example, Frankfurt, you mentioned as well, we have in Berlin, but in the different mm -hmm. regions, everywhere around the world, where we have a certain number of students, they come to back together and connect um, and uh, in uh, go spinning in the dark room, you know, <laughs> together, mm -hmm. um, depending on the location. But it's, we believe this is actually an, an amazing opportunity to do what you mentioned. The best side of both is to learn flexibly on the one hand side, but then also connect in person um, on the other hand side. And are you going to take this challenge to one billion people? One, so at the end, what we believe is we want to reach one million people in total with all one our million. programs. Mm -hmm. One million, not one billion. <laughs> <laughs> Still a difference here. <laughs> just, just to make sure. Um, If somebody is listening to that, who is interested in impact investment, in spreading education, would you be open to talk to new investors? Always, um, always love to engage with supporters, investors, anybody who really cares about um, that the transition to a sustainable society is more than welcome. Everybody who also wants to support education and invest in this field, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, best one is always to uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. um, 
we of course will link in your uh, link your LinkedIn profile down here. Many links in there, um, and um, also question: um, Would you be open to, for example, some accomplished entrepreneurs who would be willing to donate a lot of money to give his name to your business school? Let's connect. <laughs> Let's connect. Okay. Um, I would assume you are also looking for good people, like in terms of teaching stuff, also, but also other other people. Yes. So constantly as we are growing, we're looking for um, uh, people to join our team. Um, the interesting part, uh, no, we are, we, our students come from around the world. Doesn't matter if it's from North Europe um, or China or Asia um, or US, I meant, um, but also our team members. So we also have a very international team um, also working remote um, and actually very simple, similar principle. We also meet in person from time to time on the other hand side. And Yeah, um, on careers.tomorrow.university, um, you find all our current job openings. We'll also have, we also have linked down here in the show note and it's called career.tomorrow.university. And, um, the last question after I will leave you is, um, We are talking here about the state of Hessen, sponsored by the state of Hessen indirectly. Um, what would be your feedback, your wishes for the future, for the decision makers out there actually currently in the pro, uh, in the process of getting a new government in place after we had election just a few days ago? So I, I must admit, I'm so typically Germany has not the, the reputation as an innovation leader. But I must admit that the state of Hessen did actually an amazing job in that regard. Um, we are the, the first and currently only ad tech in Europe to become a state recognized university and the lead in the innovation side. And that's thanks to the ministry, um, here in mm -hmm. Hessen, uh, the Ministry of Innovation, the Ministry of Education. Um, and we are actually really excited that they are pioneering this with us together, um, from that perspective. Mm -hmm. What, what we always love, um, and also to work together and support to work on the digitalization of processes, um, and also allowing us to serve, um, students from around the world, um, which is also, again, depending on the variations of the state, uh, possible. Um, so to continuously work on actually educating and empowering the people, thinking cross, cross boundaries even, um, because, you know, this kind of, As a region now, you can also have a long and a big impact on a, way, way beyond your region. And I think this is really exciting, um, especially also for Hessen from my perspective. Yeah. So this continuous being open to that and having this kind of discussions, how can we make these things possible are really highly appreciated. Mm -hmm. Great. So. Thank you very much for the interview. I do have the feeling that we'll have you back in some time. Um, everybody who'd like to learn more, go down here in the show notes. There's a link to our Medium blog where you find the link to Tomorrow University, um, Christian's LinkedIn profile, as well as the career website and a lot of other stuff. Christian, it was a pleasure talking to you, even though we are a little bit longer than the usual uh, recording, but with all the interesting positions you had, all the interesting stories you could tell, I think that that's not surprising here. Thank you very much for being a guest. Thank you so much for the invitation, Joe. It was a pleasure to be with you. And thanks to our sponsors and have a good day. Bye-bye. That's all, folks. Find more news, streams, events, and interviews at www.startuprad.io. Remember, sharing is caring.